tell them about Jesus, but then they come to the place where they say, it is no longer because of what you said that we believe. For we have heard for ourselves and we know this is indeed the Savior of the world. Good morning. Isn't it wonderful to be in the house of the Lord this morning? Amen? Well, we are in a series called Like No Other. And if this is your first Sunday here with us, I want to welcome you. My name is Pastor Caleb, and uh, my wife and I have just moved here a few months ago, about five months ago, from overseas. And let me tell you, we've been around the world, and God is moving in North Carolina. God is moving here in this church. If you just look, if you just look around, you will see God's hand of provision and leading everywhere you look. And here at Cornerstone, it's no different. God is doing amazing things here. And we've been looking at uh, this series that focuses on Jesus. And today it's probably the greatest day to look at Jesus' life because we see that he is like no other. And he won a victory like no other on the cross. When he died for our sins in our place, was buried, and three days later he rose again, he brought with him a victory that you and I can walk in. Amen? So this morning we're going to look at uh, Jesus. And we're going to ask probably what I think is to be one of the most important questions that you can ask. And that is, did the resurrection really happen? Because if the resurrection didn't happen, then Jesus is just another martyr. But if the resurrection happened, happened, then probably the most important thing to find out is, what is the implication of it? So this morning we're going to look at, did the resurrection happen, and what is the implication of it? But before we do, I want to say this. Why did Jesus come to the earth? Why did Jesus come? If you've been with us in our series, you should know the answer. The Bible says that Jesus came that we might have life and life more abundantly or life to the full. I don't know about you, but I want to live a full life. Do you want to live a full life? The only way to live a full life is to know Jesus Christ. Let me tell you, the Bible says that he came so that we might have life to the full. You know, the, the, in the Garden of Eden, when we sinned, we were put into bondage to sin and shame and guilt. And what Jesus did on the cross was he dealt with it once and for all. So we're going to be looking at the resurrection this morning. And we're going to look at something that Paul says about the resurrection. From Paul's words in Corinthians, Paul says this, For what I have received, I passed, to you of, uh, I passed on to you as of first importance. What he's really saying is, this is the most important thing. This is the most important thing. The crux of the Christian faith depends on the resurrection. If the resurrection didn't happen, then we have nothing to celebrate. We have no hope. But because the resurrection happened, we have hope. And this morning I'm going to show you and demonstrate you that there is evidence that we we don't stand up here and simply say he is risen with no meaning behind it. When we say he is risen, we have full meaning of the implication that Jesus stood in our place, dealt with sin on the cross, went to the grave, and defeated it. Amen? There is no more sting or pain in death because Jesus defeated it. And I want you to grasp something this morning as well. Is that the resurrection is not just an event that happened a thousand plus years ago with some man. But the resurrection actually has implications to you today. We are raised to new life in Christ because of the resurrection. So how can we even know that the Bible is true? How can we even know that the New Testament hasn't been altered along the way? It was written thousands of years ago. I'm sure some of us have had these questions. Can we even know? Can we? Can we even know that it it wasn't altered? The answer is quite simple. 
And, and the answer is, yes, we can know. And it's because of a science called textual criticism. Now, I saw about three heads over here not off right when I said that. Bear with me. Bear with me. Because there's some really big words I'm about to pronounce, and you're going to want to see if I can get them right. Textual criticism simply means this. The gap between, the, the simple version is, the gap between when the event happened and the earliest copies we have. And so they measure up, when did it happen, how many copies do we have, and then do they align with one another. And so this morning, we're going to compare, just for a moment, the New Testament to some other ancient texts in history that are taught in schools and universities all across the world. The first one is, Hero ah, I've been practicing all day, I want you to know that. Herodotus, Herodotus, sorry, Herodotus, and Thucydides, 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 that's it, I got it. See, I told you, stay with me. These are Greek historians from the 5th century B.C., and what we see is that there is a 1,300-year gap between when the events take place and the first copies that we, that we have of them, a 1,300-year gap. The earliest copies we have of their writings is 900 A.D., and we only have eight copies. So this book of history, the, these two historians, we have their writings. There's only eight copies, and there's 1,300 years between when the event happened and when we have copies of it, a 1,300-year time gap. And the next one is the Roman historian Tacitus. I know this name quite well. Tacitus, um, there's a 1,000-year gap between when he, uh, w the events he's writing about and then the earliest copies we have. And we only have about 20 copies. And Tacitus actually writes about some of the things that we find in Scripture, some of the people. And then we have Caesar's Gaelic War, 950-year time gap between when it happened and we only have 9 to 10 copies of that. And then finally, Livy's famous history of Rome. We have a 900-year time gap from the event, and we only have 20 copies. So you might be asking yourself, okay, how does the New Testament compare to these books that are, that are taught as history? Well, the New Testament time gap is only 175 years. Actually, the earliest manuscripts are found 130 A.D., and we have complete New Testament manuscripts by 350 A.D. So the time gap is incredibly short. It's actually remarkable that there is such a short time between the events and the recorded copies that we have of those events. Now you might be asking, well, how many do we have? Well, let me tell you. We have 5,300 Greek manuscripts. 5,300 Greek manuscripts. There is over 10,000 Latin translations of the New Testament. 10,000 of them. And there is 9,300 other bits and pieces that co collaborate, corroborate, corroborate, one of those words, the Bible. Isn't that incredible? There is so much evidence. Simply looking at the evidence, it, it, you can't deny it. We can be confident in the accuracy, the authenticity, and the integrity of the New Testament. You know, biblical scholars really are the most privileged and fortunate position. F.J.A. Hort, who was a, a famous uh, biblical scholar, said this, In the variety and fullness of the evidence on which it rests, the test of the New Testament stands absolutely and unapproachably alone amongst ancient prose writings. No secular historian would ever disagree with that statement. We have evidence inside and outside that Jesus existed, and not only that he existed, that he rose again. And that is what we celebrate on Easter. We can look at the famous philosopher Bono. In his words, he said this, I don't think you're let off easy by saying he was a great thinker or philosopher. He said, he went around saying he was the Messiah. That's why he was crucified. He either, in my view, was the Son of God or nuts. Bono went on to say, I find it hard to accept that millions of lives, half the earth for 2,000 years, have been touched 
have felt their lives touched and inspired by some nutter. I just don't believe it. And he goes on to say, I believe Jesus is the Messiah. We have evidence this morning. We have evidence that Jesus did what he said he would do on the cross. And that is absolutely wonderful news. We have the Gospels, the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then we have John. And you know, in the Gospels, this, the, the resurrection of Jesus is recorded. And it's recorded by four separate people. And there are some variations, but they all agree on the core tenets of what happened. It's a bit like if me and you watched a football game together. You might see a play happen, and I might say, wow, look at the way the defender tackled. And you might say, well, look at the way the quarterback faked him out. You see, the same thing is, is, is seen, but is seen by different people. We, we have the same thing phenomena happen in a court of law. And so we have four individual accounts of the resurrection. And they all agree that Jesus died and was buried. There were several women at the tomb. They found it rolled away, and Jesus, the tomb was empty. And an angel spoke to them. So we have these gospel accounts, and it is evidence of the resurrection. So we're going to start this morning by looking at Matthew. Now, Matthew was a firsthand account of the story of the resurrection. So we're going to turn in our Bibles. You can if you have them. If not, we have it on the screen. Matthew 28, and that is the story of the resurrection. Early on Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. Suddenly there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and rolled aside the stone and sat on it. His face shone like lightning, and his clothing was as white as snow. The guards shook with fear when they saw him, and they fell into a dead faint. Then the angel spoke to the woman, Don't be afraid, he said. I know you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He isn't here, amen? He isn't here. He is risen from the dead, just as he said it would happen. Come and see where his body is lying. This is not just a, the resurrection is not just a moment of awe. But it should be a moment of, of great celebration, of great joy for you and for me. And we see that Matthew said that who found the tomb empty? It's not a trick question. Who found the women? This is even further evidence of the, the accuracy of the resurrection. Because you see, in those days, women's testimony was not credible. They weren't even allowed to testify in court. It was unadmissible in court. So if Matthew was trying to make up something to make it seem like Jesus rose from the dead, let me tell you, he would not have chosen women to be the bearers of that news. That proves in the time period just that it was the truth. Why did all the gospel writers say women found the tomb empty? Because it was simply true. And I have another question to ask. Would you die for something that you knew was a lie? Would you die for something that you knew was a lie? You see, almost all of the disciples died horrific deaths defending what they knew, that Jesus died, rose again, and they were set free. And if Matthew, who was one of those who died, knew that it was a lie, would he have gone to a horrific death to defend a lie? No. And, and actually, I think there's even greater evidence is that where were the disciples when Jesus went to the cross? Running, cowering in fear? The disciples were terrified. They were hiding behind locked doors. And then just a little bit later in their lives, we see them standing in the face of the people that crucified Jesus with boldness, confidence, and courage. They don't even look like the same people. And the reason is they knew Jesus resurrected from the grave. I want to ask you a question that Matthew kind of leads everyone who reads his gospel to ask. What will you do now that you've seen the evidence? What will you choose? Let me tell you this morning that you can choose not to believe. If you choose not to believe, I can't make you believe the truth even when presented with the evidence. Do you know how I know that? Because I know flat earthers exist. I've been around the world. I know. I have first-hand account. The, 
the, the earth is round. Even when presented with the evidence and the truth of the fact, people can still choose not to believe. So how will you respond? How will you respond to the truth that the resurrection happened? Because if the resurrection happened, what is the significance then? What is the significance? The significance is, is the title of the message. That Jesus won a victory like no other. A victory over sin and death. And that's why we celebrate. Jesus' victory has implications for you and for me. The Bible says this in Romans. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Being justified freely by his grace through redemption that is in Christ Jesus. This passage of scripture highlights that sin affects all of us. It affects me. It affects you. And we all have the same need for redemption. And that redemption was freely given through Jesus Christ. It speaks to the grace of God. That he loved you so much. That he would send his son to die on a cross. The Bible says, while we were still sinners, yet Christ died for us. In Ephesians, it says this, Ephesians 1, 7, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. Pastor Crosswhite read it earlier this morning. We have forgiveness. Have you ever wronged someone? Do you know how much of a burden it is? And then when you go and, and, and repent or apologize and they say, I forgive you, it's like a weight just fell off your shoulder. Jesus says, I forgive you. Simply repent and come to me. I will bear your sin and shame. Point number one is this this morning. Write it down if you're taking notes that we have redemption through Jesus Christ. Redemption, Jesus' victory is marked almost first by redemption. That's what he did on the cross. And his resurrection, he redeemed us. The act of redemption means that we're no longer a slave to sin. You know, it's, it's the greatest news ever. It really is. The greatest news ever to know you do not have to live chained to the things of this world. That you can be set free through Jesus Christ. Amen? <clears throat> the gospel at its core is, a, is this message. Freedom has been bought at the highest cost. And it has been freely given to you, to you, to you, to me. By Jesus. It's great news. The Bible also says in Ephesians 1.5, God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do and it gave him great pleasure. I love this passage of scripture. We are bought and, and he adopted us. You know what that means? Listen, you don't adopt someone that you don't want. <laughs> when you adopt someone, you bring them into your family. It's because you love them, you desire them, you treasure them. Do you remember what happened in the Garden of Eden? In the Garden of Eden, sin entered. We made a mistake and it, and it affected our relationship with God. But God chose to send Jesus and through him adopt us into, back into relationship. Point number two this morning is reconciliation. Jesus, through what he did on the cross, his death, burial, and resurrection, he reconciled us back to him. You know, God wants to have a personal relationship with you. That is absolutely astounding. That is astounding that God wants to know you and, and fellowship with you and be in relationship with you. So much that while you were his enemy, he died for you. Such great news. 1 Corinthians 15, 57 says this, But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. The, verse right, or the, the passage before this says, you know, there is no sting in death. The victory is thanks to God. And it says here that he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to tell you this morning, whatever you're going through, you can have victory in life through the resurrection of Jesus. You can have victory in whatever situation you face because of the resurrection of Jesus. In Romans 8, it says this, In all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Point number three this morning is that 
that the victory that Jesus won through his resurrection comes through his reign. The Bible says that he is seated at the right hand of the Father, reigning over all of creation. And his reign is not one of tyranny or, you know, um, we have examples of really bad leaders in the world around us in history. But Jesus' reign is unlike any of those. It's a reign of grace and truth. And as believers, we are invited into experiencing the fullness of life that comes through the reign of Jesus. Because he is seated over all, when he says something, it is true. And he says that, that we have been given new life in him. We are no longer bound to sin and shame because he defeated it on the Easter morning when he rose from the grave. These are some of the things that we get as believers. Complete and total forgiveness. Complete and total forgiveness. Does that leave anything out? Complete and total? That's all. You know that when you mess up, you don't have to, Jesus doesn't have to go back to the cross and die. He died once and it covers all your sin. Tad said it on, on Friday night. Jesus, his death on the cross and his resurrection dealt with all of our sin forever. I'm going to say it again. You must not have heard me. Jesus' death on the cross and his resurrection dealt with all of our sin forever. We will always be loved and cared for. Always. And will never be forsaken or abandoned. Now you might be asking yourself, well, how can we never be forsaken or abandoned if, if the Bible says that Jesus himself was abandoned? Jesus on the cross said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Well, the answer is simple. Jesus was forsaken so that you never have to be. Jesus was forsaken so that you never have to be. That's good news. That is good news. I want to share one final account of the, the resurrection. And I hope that this personalizes this story, this message of, of redemption, of reconciliation, and of reign. And it's the account that's found in John with Mary. Beginning in John 20, 14. This is when she was in the tomb and she turned to leave and it says this. She turned to leave and saw someone standing there. It was Jesus, but she didn't recognize him. Dear woman, why are you crying, Jesus asked her. Who are you looking for? She thought he was the gardener. Sir, she said, if you have taken him away, tell me where you have put him and I will go get him. This next verse is amazing. Mary, Jesus said, she turned to him and cried out, Rabbani, which is Hebrew for teacher, if the worship team can come. This is so cool. Mary was the first person to see Jesus after his resurrection. And you know what? Mary did not even recognize that it was Jesus. She didn't. She had been with Jesus. She had spent time with Jesus. But when she was standing face to face with Jesus, she didn't even recognize it was him. Why? Because she had made up in her mind that Jesus was dead. And what she had made up in her mind made her closed to the idea that the Savior had resurrected and was standing right in front of her. I don't know about you, but I never want to get to the place where I am so closed off to Jesus that when he's standing right in front of me, I didn't even know it was him. But we've all been there. We've all been there. Where something has happened in our life and we say, wow, what a coincidence. What a chance that was. Can't believe that happened. My luck is good today. We blame it on all these other things when in reality it's Jesus right there calling out to you. Just like he called out to Mary. He said, Mary. When she heard her name, she knew it was Jesus who was calling her. What we miss often about the resurrection story is that it's not 
just a story about something that happened in the past. But it's a story about God resurrecting you today. God giving you victory today over sin and death. And my fear is that we've heard it so much. We've heard this story so much that, that we've been closed off to the idea of, of Jesus speaking to us through this very familiar story. But catch this. God didn't just raise Jesus from the dead. He raised you from the dead and from the grave as well. Do you realize that? That when we celebrate that Jesus rose from the dead, what we're also celebrating is that we raised with him. We have new life, fullness of life in Jesus. It was God's intention that Jesus would, would reveal to us his, his character, his nature, and bring about salvation. I want to tell you this morning that if you pay attention... If you, look to, if you look to Jesus, you will find that he is closer to you now than you ever could have imagined. If you will open your heart and you will listen, you will hear Jesus calling your name just like he called Mary's name. The Bible says this in Ephesians, God so rich in mercy that he loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. If you will stand to your feet this morning. Head bow and eyes closed. This morning, if you hear Jesus calling you back to him, all you have to say is, I'm yours. He loves you. He cares for you. You're not here by accident. We have the greatest news in the world to celebrate, and that is that we can have new life through Jesus. In a moment, we're going to sing a, a, a worship song. I want to encourage you, if you want to be closer to Jesus, if you want to make a decision for the first time to follow Jesus, come to the front during that song. We'll be standing here. If you want to worship, just come to the front. Because Jesus cares about you. He died for you while you were his enemy. He said, it doesn't matter. I can pay your cost in full. If you don't have joy this morning, if you're walking through something in life that, that is, is keeping you bound down, if you need joy, let me tell you, joy is found at the empty tomb. God, I thank you for every person here. God, I thank you that you are moving and speaking and guiding and leading in all of our hearts. That you are closer than, than we could have ever imagined. And this morning as we sing this song, God, we rededicate our lives to you. We say yes to following you. And we thank you for what you've done. If you would like to receive Jesus this morning, come to the front while we sing this song. to wear my face. 
Whatever you are going through in life, there is victory in the empty tomb. There is victory that is won in Jesus. And this morning, we can celebrate. I know there are times in my life when I, I don't feel like I can celebrate. But when we trust, we put our faith and trust in Jesus, in the resurrection, it says that he won a victory that, that is our victory as well. So this morning, I want to pray over all of you. God, I just thank you. I just thank you for what you're doing this morning. And God, I just pray for victory, victory in the lives of your people, victory in the lives as they, as they go about their day, as they, as they walk through life, when they go to work, when they come home, God, victory in every area of their life. And God, I thank you that, that you have broken off the things of the enemy. If there's anything that has bound you this morning, just give it to Jesus. And I pray that as you walk into the, the same situation, you will walk in as a free person, free indeed, through the blood, the death, the resurrection of Jesus. Amen? Amen. I have a few announcements this morning. 